good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm here with uh, Dr. McAnulty this morning and also Deputy Commissioner Warboys. Can I start by uh, just saying that uh, um, the community has responded to the government's uh, request for help. Um, I really find it amazing that uh, we have uh, now 93,900 tests to 8 p.m. last night. Thank you to all of our community. That is, uh, wouldn't have even been envisaged um, last year and even a few weeks ago. So thank you for coming out in such massive numbers. That's the good news. The not so good news is that uh, unfortunately the cases continue to rise in New South Wales and here in Greater Sydney. Um, to 8 p.m. last night, we had 163 locally acquired cases. Now, that takes us up from the previous day, which was 136 cases. And of course, it was only a few days ago that we were in the 70s. So what it's telling us is we have a continuing and growing problem, uh, particularly in southwest and western Sydney. Um, I want to stress again, I want to stress again that when we look at the numbers, what we see is transmission particularly as a result of family members getting together when they just should not be getting together. We also are seeing transmission in shops and in other workplaces. So again, the message to the community is we really do need, you've come out in great numbers uh, to be tested, but we don't want you out at all from your home unless you're allowed to come out for one of the reasons that our health chief health officer and her team have advised that you can come out for. Um, out of that 163 cases, there were 66 cases that arose directly as a result of being household contacts. 25 arose as a result of being close contacts. And very worryingly, very worryingly, 45 were infectious out in the community. In other words, 45 people were out walking around and potentially spreading the virus, which certainly explains why our numbers are going up. The local government areas, the broad areas of Sydney that are the major areas of concern um, remain, as we've been talking about. Um, Fairfield, saw 34 cases. Canterbury Bankstown, and you'd remember we talked about this a few days ago that we were concerned to see cases extending into that area of Canterbury Bankstown. There are now 44 cases, it's 8 p.m. So unfortunately Canterbury Bankstown um, is uh, the unhappy winner of this uh, race that we don't want to happen. Cumberland um, is now showing up quite dramatically with 26 cases. Blacktown has 15 cases to last night, and Liverpool, thankfully, is a little lower at six. Now, I want to stress those numbers really speak for themselves in a sense, but I want to stress that as at midnight last night, um, regretfully, the government had to place further restrictions on movements of workers outside the local government areas of Cumberland and Blacktown. So, I think most of the community would be very familiar now with the restrictions that have operated in the first three local government areas, restricting workers from leaving their local government area unless they are an authorised worker. And of course that now means that we have restrictions on all workers, including authorised workers, um, in uh, five local government areas in Sydney being the original three, of course, plus, uh, plus Cumberland and Blacktown last night. Um, I want to stress again that uh, in Fairfield, um, any authorised workers can only leave that area uh, if they have three daily tests, those surveillance tests that we've talked about a lot in the last uh, week or two. And in Canterbury Bankstown, um, health and aged care workers, so everybody that would work in a, an aged care environment, uh, hospital environment, obviously nurses, medical staff, uh, cleaners, security staff, uh, cooks, uh, whoever it be, 
have to have three day three daily surveillance tests. I think the basic message out of all of this is that the community, we really need our community, particularly in southwestern and western Sydney, to stay at home, to hear the message and stay at home. And don't intermingle with family members from other households. It will continue to cause massive grief here in Sydney, uh, particularly in western and southwestern Sydney, if family members uh, mix with family members from other households. Just please stop doing it. Stop. Um, I'll ask Dr McAnulty to actually say a little about just one mixing of family members that resulted in 18 cases. Just one group of family members coming together with other family members where they shouldn't have been and that accounted for 18 cases. Um, I also want to stress that uh, um, obviously New South Wales has expressed our concern yesterday. Dr Chant gave us uh, gave the crisis cabinet very strong advice that she considered that what we were going through here in New South Wales is a national emergency. By that what she was really saying was we need the help that other states and territories could possibly give us. Um, I want to remind those other states and territories that last time I looked, we were a common wealth. We worked together. And it disturbs me that it would appear that all we've ever done to work together has just seemingly been cast aside. When we have bushfires, when we have floods, People from our state go to help others. We know that and I, I can't thank New South Wales residents for the years and years of contribution to other states. Equally, those other states send their community, their emergency workers, their fire workers, their SESs, they come to us and help. Last year when Victoria was in trouble um, and from this end we were thankfully not suffering the same problems that our Victorian uh, colleagues and friends were suffering. I personally said goodbye to a number of health staff who went down to Victoria and put their lives on the risk, uh, at risk, put their lives on the line. I personally as health minister here stood proudly with them in this very building and welcomed many of them back. And what they told me was that they really did feel that they had risked their lives in going down there, but that was what they were prepared to do to support our friends in Victoria, our fellow Australians in Victoria. I just want to emphasise that from my point of view, it's with disappointment that I heard some of the responses from leaders from other states. I can't quite see the difference between beating back fires and beating back and addressing the problems of floods and beating back this COVID virus that could actually, if it gets worse here in New South Wales, could actually create massive problems for the whole country. New South Wales is the gateway to the rest of Australia. We've done enormous work to bring back so many Australians. More than half of all Australians who've come back have come back through the gateway of Sydney. And we continue to step up and make sure that we support our nation, our commonwealth. And I certainly ask for the other leaders in our other states to reflect on that, because we need the Pfizer that they may have uh, not such a great need for at the present time. We have a very young population in southwest and western Sydney. And based on the advice that the federal government have given after they took advice from their experts, their medical experts, there are many people in, that, in those areas at this stage that are really in need of Pfizer. We need them to have the Pfizer. So I would just ask again for that to be considered. Now I'll ask for Dr McAnulty to take us through particularly some of the detail and I'd like him, if you don't mind, Doctor, to also raise and make aware the various people in the various suburbs. It would be a long list, I would think, but I'd like you to make aware to the community what suburbs in those two new LGAs have the worker restrictions. Um, and then I'll ask uh, the Deputy Commissioner to make some comments and then we'll take questions. 
Thank you, Minister, and good morning. Uh, as the Minister mentioned, 163 locally acquired cases were identified in the 24 hours to 8 o'clock last night. 87 of these locally acquired were linked to known cases or cluster, and the source of 42 remain under investigation. One new case was acquired overseas. There have been uh, 1,940 uh, locally acquired cases since this epidemic began on the 16th of June. Uh, pleasingly, we saw over 93,000 tests in the community, which is a record. Sadly, there was a death announced yesterday in a man in his 80s from Sydney Southwest, which is included in today's numbers. And New South Wales Health, we express our condolences to the man's family. Uh, that brings to uh, 62 people who have died uh, related to the uh, pandemic, including six in the current outbreak. Um, We've got a number of areas of concern where we're calling out people to be particularly cautious for monitoring for symptoms and coming forward for testing at even the mildest of symptoms. On the north coast, that's Coffs Harbour and Byron Bay. In southern New South Wales, that's Moss Vale, Goulburn, Maroolan. In western New South Wales, Orange. In western Sydney, the Cumberland LGA, particularly Marylands, Guildford and Greystains. Tungabbey, Seven Hills. Pendle Hill, Mount Druitt, Rooty Hill, Blacktown. In northern Sydney, Belrose. In the inner west, Lakemba, Roselands, Punchbowl, Wiley Park, Belmore, Burwood, Campsey. In southwestern Sydney, Fairfield LGA, which includes Smithfield and a range of other places. Liverpool LGA, particularly Hoxton Park, Carnes Hill, Voyager Point. Uh, Canterbury Bankstown, particularly Sefton, Yuguna, and Chester Hill. Uh, and Campbelltown, particularly Bardia. In South East Sydney, George's River, Bayside, Sutherland, Haymarket, and Wollongong and Port Kembla in the Illawarra. There was an event in Pendle Hill where we're concerned about where there seemed to be 18 cases associated with a family gathering, um, which took place following a, a tragedy in the family. It's an example of how families coming together, even in tragic times, can actually, um, when you're naturally grieving, can be a risk where COVID can easily take hold and spread among family members and then out to their households and further afield. We're working very closely with the community and community leaders to try and make sure that all those family members uh, are tested and isolated. The Minister mentioned just how serious this disease is and the numbers in hospitalisation is, is quite serious. We've got 139 people with COVID admitted to hospital at the moment. 37 are in intensive care and 17 require ventilation. Um, and 55 of those people are aged under 55, so they're not all old people. In fact, 28 are under 35 years of age. By vaccination status of those 37 people in ICU, um, 36 are not vaccinated and one is partially vaccinated, having received a first dose of AstraZeneca. The Minister mentioned um, Cumberland and Blacktown LGAs are now part of the new order for authorised workers to only leave those are the areas. I'm going to lead, read the list of uh, suburbs there because there's quite a lot, but it's important people know uh, what those suburbs are. In Cumberland, Auburn, Barella, Chester Hill, Fairfield, Girraween, Granville, Greystains, Guildford, Guildford West, Hollyroyd, Homebush West, Lidcham, Mays Hill, Marylands, Marylands West, Pummel Way, Pendle Hill, Prospect, Regents Park, Rookwood, Smithfield, South Granville, South Wentworthville, Toon Gabby, Wentworthville, Westmead, Wood Park, and Yonora. And in Blacktown, Acacia, Angus, Arndell Park, Bidwell, Blackett, Blacktown, Bunger, Bunger, Bunger Ribby, Colby, Dean Park, Durrock, Duneside, Eastern Creek, Emerton, Glendenning, Glenwood, Gratham Farm, Hassel Grove, Hebersham, Huntingwood, Killyville Ridge, Kings Langley, Kings Park, Lalo Park, Lethbridge Park, Murrayong, Marsden Park, Milan Bar, Mitchenbury, Mount Druitt, Nurimba, Fields, Oakhurst, Parkley, Plumpton, Prospect, Quakers Hill, Richards, Riverston, Rooty Hill, Ropes Crossing, Rouse Hill, Schofields, Seven Hills, 
uh, Shelville, Shelby, uh, Shane's Park, San Hope, San Hope Gardens, St Mary's, Talawong, La Ponds, Toongabbie, Tregear, Vineyard, Whalen, Wilmot and Woodcroft. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. McNulty, Minister. Uh, good morning. Uh, 246 uh, penalty notices issued in the last 24 hours. Uh, I want to highlight um, three of those, but in particular the three of them relate to exactly the same thing. That is, people making a conscious decision to have people to their house that aren't entitled to be there, that the public health orders say should not be there, and they make this conscious decision to have a party and invite people around at not just a risk to themselves but to their families. One of these events was at Piermont where police were called uh, last night and eight people uh, in that premise received infringement notices for $1,000. Another event was at Riverwood where six people uh, came together to have a birthday party and each of those people was issued an infringement notice for $1,000. And then at Belmont near Newcastle, where they can only have five people in their house, they're outside of Greater Sydney, but they chose to have 10 people in that house, have a party that was not just in the house, but um, continued out into the backyard. Police were called, and a number of calls to police. So these are uh, events where people in their neighbourhood are so concerned that they're calling the police to go around and conduct an investigation and try and um, set those people straight in terms of the risk that they pose to themselves and also that community. The easy part is just that, where people ring up and the police attend, they make an investigation and they issue the infringement notices. The hard part for everyone to get their head around is the fact that this Delta strain is so transmissible that people will quite consciously invite people into their house and each and every one of those people then returns to their home with the bright prospect of infecting everyone in their household. We've seen it happen before, and this sort of behaviour is highly irresponsible and is quite conscious in terms of that people are actually planning these events and inviting people around. They know it is outside the public health order because on each of these occasions, when police turn up and ask the owner of the house and the people at the party, they're quite aware of the public health orders. So it really is a conscious effort to drag down the millions of people every single day, no matter how hard and challenging it is, are doing the right thing. Right across Greater Sydney and in regional New South Wales, there are so many good examples of where people, despite the disruption it brings to their life, despite the things they have to put off and miss out are abiding by the public health orders and making sure that their effort goes towards putting New South Wales in the best possible position every single day. I really want to reach out to those people on behalf of New South Wales Police that continue to, to do the right thing and make our job so much easier. But be rest assured, where there's a complaint to Crime Stoppers or where police see behaviour that puts the community at risk, we will continue to take strong and quick action. Thank you. Health Minister. Yeah. Uh, Good morning, you, you seem um, quite resigned today with these numbers. You seem frustrated that obviously we are still seeing people breaking the rules. For months now, you've been calling for people to not have others to their own homes. What else can we possibly do to stop that? Do we need to increase the fines? I think we've said all the way along the line through this uh, health crisis that fines and penalties are one small part of what, what, is, what has to occur. But the main issue here is the orders are only really designed to send clear messages to the community about how we can all collectively get out of this, this terrible pandemic that we're in. Um, I think uh, the government is certainly uh, doing everything it can to work with the local community. Um, I want to thank the local uh, community leaders. They, they can't tell you how wonderful in Fairfield and the other LGAs the local community leaders have been um, to reach out. Now we, we're a very multicultural society in southwest and western Sydney and we have 
it's one of the, the joys of this nation that we are a proud multicultural nation. But sometimes people who've come from overseas perhaps uh, have suffered at the hands of other governments and perhaps that getting the messages through um, is challenging. So we need to find ways to, uh, to keep working at that and get the messages through. That's certainly what our government's been talking to a lot of the community leaders about. So my focus is not on, not on uh, increased penalties. It's about just making sure that people understand that uh, the most dangerous thing you can do in a pandemic is to be near another human being. Now, we all need to do that. That's an essential human need. But we also have to recognise that this virus can only get from one person to another when we're relatively close to each other. So if we can just stay in our own households, it's been across the world um, that every government has struggled to get this message through to various sections of the community. But I think, uh, and I asked the media to help us in that, um, to focus on that and try and get the message out to, to the community and also to get vaccinated. We've talked about that. Um, talked yesterday about being heartened by a particular um, uh, radio station that was doing some work. I saw in one of the papers today uh, a whole lot of celebrities who uh, were talking about getting vaccinated. Those are the sorts of positive things that we also need to intermingle with um, the sadder messages about people actually getting the virus and, and dying. Minister, Sorry, I'll, you're next. Let's just go to, yep. Should there be a ring of steel around Sydney? Dan Andrews thinks there should be. Is that is that being considered at all? Look, Mr Andrews has his entitlement to deal with his community in the way he wants to deal with it. I did notice that, that the um, police union in uh, Victoria had expressed uh, concerns about putting all your eggs in a ring of steel type concept. I don't see that as being the, uh, the appropriate uh, approach. We already have, um, we have uh, limits in terms of workers being able to come out of the five most challenged local government areas at the present time. Um, so I think that's uh, it's very appropriate as to the balance that we've struck to date. Minister, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the outcome of National Cabinet yesterday, and you have alluded to these earlier. But if a decision is made to delay the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine from three to six weeks, what guarantee will be in place that the people who have received the first dose will get that second jab? Is there, is there a risk that uh, uh, that might not happen until mid-August or, you know, given the complexities around supply? The preferred position from our Chief Health Officer and therefore our government, um, and I stress this was discussed at Crisis Cabinet, with, I think sometimes uh, there's a view that we only we obviously take health advice, but it has to be considered in the broader context of what's going on with the numerous other people that we talk to. But the health advice was clearly that we needed to get Pfizer in substantial amounts into the arms of the younger population in southwestern and western Sydney. Our preferred position then is to get greater access to Pfizer. Um, the delay in the second dose of Pfizer I just remind the community that it's normally about three weeks, or has been to date. Uh, so first jab, and then three weeks later have the second jab. Uh, the reason for looking at that is really more a, a case of, well, if we can't get our friends in other states or our federal government to respond to our request, then how else can we do it? And so the second, the alternative, the second, second choice, it's not the preferred choice, is to put out the second dose and try and get a much greater percentage of the population, particularly in southwest and the west and part of Sydney, to have their first dose. And the reason for that is that we know that when you've had your first dose, there is a greater, well, you have substantially increased protection against uh, the virus. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not the best choice. It's perhaps the only choice we're going to have if we don't get some help from the federal government or from the other states and territories. How would that work, but, Minister? If you've had your first shot, does that mean you give your second appointment essentially to someone else, or is that going to kick in a bit it's, later? It's, or? It's, it's a good question. It's, it's actually really difficult because in, in, in organising, just say as a, through our uh, state hub, for example, where we do um, a lot of this, as I think I said this week, on one day last week we did nearly 
uh, more than 8,000, almost 9,000 uh, Pfizer in one day and just 50 um, AstraZeneca. Um, that means, if you think about that, that we have thousands and thousands of people who've already been booked in for their second dose. And I know that the that part of health, not the public health side, but the people who actually organise giving the jabs, are very concerned at all of the work that would have to go on to try and contact all of those individuals who are booked in and expecting their second dose in three weeks and say to them, sorry, we're going to have to put you off for a few weeks. It's a huge, huge administrative task um, and it, it is not the preferred uh, position. It's just not. It's just, it's creating havoc for us. But if that's, if that's what we're being handed by our, our friends in other states and in the Commonwealth, then we have to do what we have to do. Minister, lifeline calls are up Jess. 30%. Hello. Lifeline calls are up 30%. I'm in sorry, New I just missed that. Lifeline calls to oh, yeah. Lifeline are up 30% in New South Wales. So mm. singles, especially singles that live alone, are feeling pretty isolated at the moment. Why won't you consider allowing a singles bubble? Jess, we have actually considered it. Um, now, let me say that I don't think there'd be any of us, any of the journalists here or anybody outside this building that would not know someone and possibly themselves actually who are suffering from the stresses of being isolated uh, from family and friends it's just it's rife it's everywhere and as health minister um, and I know I share this with uh, Minister Bronnie Taylor who's my colleague who is principally the Minister of Mental Health um, it's it's an awful dilemma um, for us we have talked about it, but we're also really concerned at the moment about if we move down that path, whether the messaging would be clear on the major issue, which is people coming together, as you just heard, um, and thinking it's OK to come together in groups. But I can promise you we've spent quite a bit of time agonising about that one. And if we can just get to a certain point, I don't know what that point is yet. Um, yeah, we want people to be able to have, if you're a single person, you should be able to have someone come in to you and sit with you. But can I stress this? Um, under the health orders, um, in limited circumstances where you form a view that the particular person that you know that might need what you're talking about, uh, you can uh, for care and compassionate reasons. Um, but I would just say that you can, you can visit. But that's a very, very difficult situation. So I would just say right now, where we're seeing this virus just growing and growing and growing and so many more people ending up in our hospital and so many more people ending up in intensive care. I would just say to families that please uh, exercise extreme caution and preferably do not visit any other household. Charlotte, can I just go to Robbie? Has that one yet? Thank you, yeah. Mr. Um, on the same day, Dan Andrews has said, no, we're not going to help New South Wales. He's also suggesting how you should be handling this pandemic. Behind the scenes, you've been very diplomatic this morning, but you, you're infuriated by that. The second part is, does Mr Andrews not have the right to give that advice on the basis of wanting to protect his own state from what's happening here? Look, I think during the entire now nearly 20 months of this pandemic, as Health Minister, I have never expressed a word negatively about any other state or territory, and I'm not about to. And I won't reflect on Mr Andrews. What I will say is that um, I have the highest regard for health ministers right around the country. We all work together um, and uh, we share confidences in each other about how we're doing the work we're doing in our respective states. <clears throat> and, and as late as only about an hour ago, um, I had yet one more discussion with uh, Martin Foley, who I have the highest regard for, the Minister for Health in Victoria. And I'm quite sure that, um, that leaders are being given advice by their health ministers and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Sorry, can I come to you in a sec? It's been reported this morning that Scott Morrison has decided to give New South Wales some extra doses from their emergency stockpile. Can you confirm that and how many would that be? I can't confirm that because I don't know that. I've seen nothing in writing if that's happened. Um, one of the frustrations I must say that I've had, um, and I'm, look, I'm just being open and honest here because there is no other alternative at this point. Uh, last year I was frustrated and I think a number of other ministers were frustrated, health ministers were frustrated because we never got to find out what was in the national stockpile of PPE, personal protective equipment. So we went about making sure in New South Wales our staff were protected. I think we had one warehouse of public personal protective equipment at the beginning of the year and we now have 10. Um, if we could do the same and get 
via, uh, get a vaccine from some other source, we would. But unfortunately, the world is not that simple. Um, I have no idea how much, if any, are in a national stockpile. I simply don't know that. I'd like to know. Minister Hazard. Yeah. Um, just back to these people having... Um, but, but can I say, if the Prime Minister has said that, and if he is, I welcome that offer. Um, I just need to see it in writing and know exactly what that means. If it simply means we're going to get a few more... Um, I mean, we, we do 9,000, almost 9,000 in, in one hub every day. We're doing literally tens of thousands every day, and we know we have a very substantial population in southwestern and western Sydney. I read out the numbers earlier as to how that's now expanding through those areas. Why did we have to take those provisions last night uh, on Cumberland? Limiting, limiting people's capacity to work is, is a horrific decision for a government. And to do that again last night in two further very big local government areas is horrible. <laughs> but we had to do it. So if we can get the Pfizer that we need to get it out, we'll do everything we can. We'll work with our chemists, we'll work with our GPs, we'll work with everybody to get it into people's arms. We just need to get it in order that we can do it. At the moment, it's like fighting a war with both arms behind your back. Yes, Charlotte. Um, in regards to people having others to their own homes, can you, how often are we seeing this sort of scenario where people are, is it every day and also, that uh, situation in Pendle Hill you spoke of, it sounds like the family were grieving, but are others simply having them over to share a meal and to socialise, or is it babysitting because people are going out to work? What's the nature of these gatherings? Everything. It's just everything. And people, uh, I think human beings are human beings. We love being with our family and our friends. Um, and it's completely the reverse in a pandemic as to what we need you to do. We need you to do the exact opposite. We're very lucky, I suppose, to some extent, but in the sense that we have social media opportunities, we have phones, we have Zoom, we have all sorts of things these days where we can talk to each other. Um, but some of, the, some of these people in these various communities find it very difficult. They may not have that. And culturally, they may have an even greater need than perhaps other, other people from other parts of the world who are here, including most Australians of we love our families, but I guess it depends on what part of the world you've come from as to the, how that operates in your mind, in your culture, in your head. And we're finding that a struggle to get our message through that it's the most dangerous thing that you can do. Can you Sir? Uh, sorry, can I just take this one yeah, and sure. then get... Just, if possible, we'd like to finish it a little earlier than we normally do. Yeah, sorry. The, the yeah. first question is, um, so the Premier has spoken about targeted and localised restrictions. Um, what could that mean? Could it mean for example, that restrictions are lifted in parts of Sydney with low or no COVID cases? Or could it mean that fully vaccinated people will be given the right to visit or carpool with other fully vaccinated do, do, people? Do you mind if I don't hypothesise on that at the moment? Because at the moment, our focus is actually on just trying to make sure the message gets through to families in these very challenging areas to not go, not go to each other's household. It's the only thing, in the absence of the vaccine, it's the only thing that is going to stop this virus. Um, and I think it's a, it, your question is obviously a legitimate question. I can say this, that the crisis cabinet, um, which consists of very senior ministers and very senior public servants, is certainly looking at all those issues. But at the moment, our focus is really on just trying to get the message through to bring the virus transmission down. Minister, there are a lot of people right now Sorry. Um, so it's not really hypothetical. There are... Um, you know, 40-year-olds who are fully vaccinated yeah. and their mother in their but, 60s and 70s also fully vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. But, can, but the issue here is that we need to get that message through. But can I say that obviously as a community gets more and more vaccinated, then we can open up and be more free. And that's what's been seen overseas. But you also have to be very cautious because we're also seeing tens of thousands of people getting it, even in uh, England and the US where they have very high vaccination rates but they've got a large unvaccinated population and if you ask any of the expert e epidemiologists they'll tell you that if you still have a very substantial proportion of your population unvaccinated when you're opening up uh, even in a small area you can still have a major problem because you can still have a lot of people getting the virus and I just want to remind people who are listening that being fully vaccinated doesn't stop you getting the virus and doesn't stop you transmitting it to other people. And that's the key issue to what you're talking about. Can I just take yours, then I'm going to let um, Dr McInulty answer Robert's question. Yeah, worried. 
and this might also be a question I'm not sure, but um, I just wanted to know, has there been any cases of transmission during intimate partner visits? Uh, good try, Jess. I don't think I'll actually ask him that one. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but you know what, we've, we've made that exception. Um, was, Robert, you want to ask Dr. McAnulty? Yeah, yeah, thank Dr. McAnulty. Dr. McAnulty, um, rapid antigen testing, uh, the, the, the voice has been growing louder and louder and louder. The way it has been described to me by one prominent, two prominent epidemiologists and a senior person at the AMA is that the pathology industry is a cartel where it is the pathology health network that is advising government use our tests only, we're the gold standard. There is evidence right around the world and adoption in all of Europe and America of rapid antigen testing, not to compete with PCR, but to complement it. The difference being between a sniper that has 100% accuracy but very slow load time, or a machine gun with 98% accuracy. Is New South Wales going to adopt rapid antigen testing? And if it ever does, why is it coming so late if the same information was available to the government months ago? So um, the use of various tests depends on the probability that a population or a community or a person has the disease. And in this situation where we we're trying to find every single person with COVID accurately, um, we rely on PCR testing, which has been tried and true and has, is a very accurate system. But we depend on, we have a range of expert advisors across the country. Yeah, There's a public health... pathologists who get paid by the government to subsidise to use their tests. The, 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 the um, pu public health network uh, laboratories around the country are publicly employed uh, workers, um, but we also consult regularly with uh, private providers. But we also have our own independent epidemiologists who review data on a regular basis from around the world. Um, the issue is about where the epidemic is in your particular locations and what the best value tests are. And at the moment, for diagnosis, PCR tests is the tried and true and proven. In fact, we're developing much more rapid tests that we can use in special situations, and we're using those that's now. saliva with a mid-80% accuracy. We're talking about rapid antigen tests with up close to 100%. In the UK, 120,000 cases that would not have even seen a laboratory were successfully diagnosed with rapid antigen tests who wouldn't have got a test because they were asymptomatic. Just people every day going about their job, leaving quarantine, leaving work, workers uh, and hotels. We're continually reviewing with our experts what the best suit of tests are and suite of tests are for certain sick. And it may well be that down the track that rapid antigen testing does have a role. But we will keep cases, sir, in a national emergency. At what time? The health department has known about this for many months. At what time is a review going to come up with, a, with an answer in line with the rest of the world? 163 cases, while alarming, is still a tiny proportion of the population. And so what we're needing to do is have very rapid, very accurate tests about what's happening. But of course, we are reviewing the place for all these different tests and emerging technologies as they come about. And we don't want to uh, cross out anything that might be useful. And so we'll continue to review with our experts at this place. Dr. Murphy, uh, an email circulated last week uh, to a number of hospitals showed that Prince of Wales Hospital, the staff there, 63% were unvaccinated. Do you understand that statistic to be correct? And if so, is this hospital staff not wanting to get the vaccine or is this them uh, not having the opportunity yet? No, I, I can't confirm that number, I don't know. The, but the message is we are trying to get everyone vaccinated as soon as we can in terms of the priority lists. And so it's important, of course, that um, all our staff are vaccinated. Doctor, I've just a question. Uh, another day with high numbers today. Uh, the Premier indicated yesterday wouldn't be in a position to lift the lockdown at the end of next week. What is your short-term modelling suggesting? Well, can I just indicate, oh sorry, can I indicate that um, Dr Chant, I think a week ago, I don't think you were here at that stage, but Dr Chant indicated that we were hopeful and, and the Premier indicated that we were hopeful the numbers would start to come down. And modelling of course depends on the input of numbers as to the output of numbers and there's a whole series of mo uh, models that can be used. I remember sitting in a meeting in February or March last year, uh, must have been about March last year, where we were told we would have 25,000 deaths in New South Wales last year. Uh, we didn't because of the actions we took. So modelling is very much dependent upon what the input is. It really is impossible to answer that question with precision. Jess, just answering your question earlier about intimate partners, I, I did just ask, um, uh, the Deputy Commissioner has no knowledge of anybody actually 
being caught up in that situation. So, yeah. Councillor, what's Brendan's role with the land in Sydney today? And this might be one for the Deputy Commissioner as well, but I just wanted to ask, they're protesting both the lockdown and the vaccines. What are your thoughts on that? We live in a democracy, um, and normally I am certainly one who support people's right to protest, but I actually think it's really silly. At the present time, we've got cases going through the roof, and we have people thinking that it's OK to get out there and possibly be close to each other in a demonstration. I just think that's a bit silly. But anyway. Liz, sorry, can I do that? Then I'll hand over to, and then we'll maybe finish. Yeah, sorry. What are the options being considered for schools? Um, there's some argument they should be considered essential industries. Um, I know sorry, that was that schools? Yeah, there are, there are arguments that they should be considered essential industries. There, I believe there are going to be options considered this weekend. Would it be more likely to send primary schools back or year 12 back or, you know? Can I, can I just say at this stage that, it, that uh, I want to thank um, all of the uh, colleagues who work in education, my colleague Sarah Mitchell. She has been in constant contact about all of the options, but they're also taking their advice from obviously the health team, the public health team, Dr Chant and her team. And at this stage, the advice hasn't changed so that uh, at the moment it will continue, but it, it's under constant review. Again, I wish I had, I think I heard the Premier use that expression the other day, crystal ball, but I can't answer that question at this stage. Can I just ask the uh, you, somebody asked the Commissioner? Deputy Commissioner? Uh, I was just about Deputy to Commissioner Lizzie, okay. Today. Sorry. Yeah. Deputy Commissioner, just with that on this freedom rally today, what's your view on it? And secondly, what's going to the police response likely to be? Now, I can only echo what the, uh, the Minister said. I think it's not um, really the time uh, for people to uh, come together closely uh, to exercise some, uh, what they would think is their democratic right, and it may well be. Uh, New South Wales Police are um, in a position where they um, will try uh, and work with the organisers and the specific group leaders to make sure that uh, they comply with the public health orders. Uh, and in fact, we don't get a situation where we end up with a a spreading event uh, in Sydney, which would, uh, of course, be disastrous. But police, um, there is additional police. There is a specific police operation around uh, the protest and the events. And we want to work with the organisers and those people uh, who are leading specific groups uh, into the city or other places to make sure that it's not an event that we regret. Thank you, everybody. Can I just also quickly thank I sort of say it quietly and quickly, but I just want to say the Auslan um, interpreters have done an amazing job now for 18 months, and I just want to thank you for making sure that people who are hearing impaired actually do hear the message. Um, hopefully everybody can hear the message. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.